Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session. Today, um, my name is A.P. Naren, and uh, I have my wonderful colleague here, Dr. Ruby Wang. And we welcome you to the session again. And today we'll be talking about the delivery to the lung, the right technology, the right cell. We have a distinguished group of speakers here. So the idea is to look at the initiative to address CF genetic repair requires additional advanced knowledge of cellular targets most relevant to clinical benefits as case point. CFTR is high, highly expressed in pulmonary inocytes. However, little is known about the physiological and functional significance of inocyte biology to normal thing lung tissue or importance of CFTR res rescue for mitigating CF lung disease. This order of benefits of CF lungs. Presentation directed towards inocyte biology, CF mucosal glands, basal cells, etc., will be discussed. The session will review the role of potential impact of these and other cell types as targets to CF intervention. So, as, a, as an example, what, what I want to talk about is a little study here. So this was uh, a set of five control and five CF patient uh, submucosal gland that we isolated. Uh, Kushik, who is in the audience here, and Catherine Weikenheiser, who is the pathologist, surgically isolated these uh, tissues. And uh, Yan Zhu and Jeff Witzet did a, a single cell RNA-seq analysis. So as you can see, um, we were able to um, do single cell RNA-seq studies from this. Uh, most of it was uh, epithelial cells because surgically we were able to isolate the submucosal gland. And a small percentage, around 30, 40% of it were non uh, and epithelial cells. A large percentage of it was also serosal cell. Much of this data is going to be uh, deposited in the human uh, atlas of the lung very soon. Uh, again, this is Yanzu and Jeff Witzet's data. So they have been gracious in allowing me to use it. They were able to show there are 22 different cell types. And of course, the features are all shown on the right-hand side, classically what J and uh, John have all talked about previously, nothing new here. But the point I want to make here is this slide. The CFTR expression distribution, the, if you look at the averages of both uh, wild type and delta, the point I want to make here is that if you look at inocyte, the, uni unica, the unique molecular identification per cell in inocyte could be seven, and it could range to anywhere from 0 0.01 in myoepithelial cells, whereas cells that express a lot of cell types, that is serosal mucosal cells and ductal cells, which have very less CFTR compared to inocytes, have the most amount of transcript overall. So the point here is, what is inocytes which are compared to a very small percentage of cells overall playing a role? So this distinguished group of speakers that we have are going to address this question, I hope. So what is this session going to do? The speakers, J. Raj Gopal, is going to talk about new insights into airway epithelial hierarchy. John Ingelart is going to define cellular function and pulmonary inocyte using genetic ferret models. John Ingelhart is going to talk about the quest for granularity in airway ion transport. Bridget Gongatz is going to talk about single cell resolution of the repairing airway, and of course, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Wang, is, Ruby Wang, is going to talk about de novo generation of pulmonary inocytes from induced pluripotent stem cells. With that, I request Dr. J. Raj Gopal, who is professor of Harvard Medical School and also professor of Center of Regenerative Medicine of MGH to come and present his talk without any further ado. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've never been introduced by someone who can pronounce my name better than I can, so it was, <laughs> it was a pleasure to hear it done properly. Um, I'm always intimidated to come to this audience because I'm not a cystic fibrosis expert, nor am I an expert in electrophysiology, uh, but I've learned a little bit over time, uh, and I'll try to tell you what we've learned more recently about ionocytes. Um, Let's see. Is 
there a way to, there we go. So uh, our discovery of ionocytes was by dumb luck. Uh, we were not looking for ionocytes. We were interested in single cell sequencing to identify stem cell heterogeneity. And then, lo and behold, a weird cell popped up. At the time, there were only 8,000 cells in this mouse tracheal epithelium. And we found three ionocytes. We would have dismissed them if there were two as artifacts. Now, these days, we would do thousands of cells. But the reason that we were able to identify them is because their expression signature was so unique. Um, I actually thought it was an artifact, and it took me a long time to convince myself it was real. So little was known about these cells that we called them ionocytes simply because fish and frog skin have cells that express the transcription factor FOXI1, and there was high CFTR. And fish gills uh, in fish that move from freshwater to salt water have CFTR expression. But that was really the limits of of what we knew and why we called the cell an ionocyte. Uh, I want to point out, fortunately, another group discovered them at the same time as we did, which gave me a little bit of confidence that it might be more than an artifact. Um, it did seem uh, that has been addressed already that the abundance of CFTR was in the ionocytes. The funny thing is the cell it's supposed to be on, the ciliated cell, is the only cell that seems to not express any of it. Uh, so there's always something new to learn. Uh, and the loss of that transcription factor, FOXI1, decreased CFTR expression. Again, lending credence to maybe the idea that this was a bona fide cell. The thing that I know about the physiology, which is exceptionally little, and I don't think I'm going to be able to tell you anything about the physiology, is that in the FOXI1 knockout mouse trachea, which you will all realize is suspect as a model of human uh, pulmonary disease, there is this OCT image. There's excess stuff above the epithelium. Uh, with the help of my colleagues, since I don't know anything about cystic fibrosis, immediately able to plug into a terrific group of people, including Steve Rowe and Martin, and what we clearly saw was that in the FOXI1 knockout trachea of the mouse, there was increased viscosity. And then there were confusing things. For example, the ciliary beat frequency was too high. And there was a compensatory chloride current. All this above my head, but I remember multiple like group calls where we couldn't sort out what it was. And you all know that the mouse trachea isn't going to be where we're going to get the answers from. Um, but suffice it to say, I don't know what this ionocyte does, and I'm relying on John and John to teach us what it actually does. But I did want to point this out. That we weren't the ones to discover the ionocyte. Uh, John Engelhart and I think others actually realized that there are very uh, high CFTR expressing cells. And John actually published this somewhere, I can't remember where, but there's an arrow to a cell where it says MR, and I think the MR stands for mitochondria-rich cell, uh, which is the ionocyte. To this day, I can't tell what John was looking at. Uh, if a postdoc showed me this, I'd be like, what are you talking about? There's no cell there. But his eyes were able to discriminate something unique that ultimately turns out to be the ionocyte, or the jackpot cell, or the hot cell. So there's actually ample evidence in history before we identified the cell type. Let me switch gears. There's been tons of single cell sequencing now. It was only four years ago that Aviv and I did that experiment. But now it's de rigueur to have, you can't publish without a single cell sequencing experiment. And there have been a lot of them now in the human. Uh, lots. In fact, this is the one area aside from cystic fibrosis where the lung is in the lead. We probably have more cells and better atlases than almost any other organ aside from the brain. Um, but strangely enough, there are not certain cells that are well represented. So we decided to go deep, like really, really deep. So we profiled a few patients, like eight, and we got 420,000 cells. The reason is my lab is sort of most interested in these rare cells the ionocyte, but also the tough cell and the neuroendocrine cell. I won't tell you a lot about them, but, and I can't even tell you today why I'm so fascinated by them, 
But the main reason is because the tracheal epithelium is composed of a lot of common cells. And then there's these rare stochastically distributed 1% cells. And I think there's a lot of deep commonalities amongst them. But in order to find them, you have to sequence a lot of cells. Three is not enough. As I told you, if we found two, it would have been artifact. So we just went deep. And when we went deep, we found everything that everyone else has found. So basically, we've gone deep enough. Uh, and the, the, the holy grail then becomes the rare cells because they're so rare. Um, and this is just a summary of the studies that have been done. You can see of all these human lung cell atlas studies, many of them don't even recover rare cells. That's how hard they are to find. Um, so we see three major types of cells in the, in the human now. We see neuroendocrine cells. We see PLU2F3 progenitor cells. And we see ionocytes. And these are the numbers. And there might be a couple of hundred others uh, in the literature. But we'll make sure all of this is deposited to either lung map uh, or the Human Cell Atlas website. So you'll be able to get gene expression on ionocytes to this depth. You know, I would guess that you'd be able to get probably a thousand ionocyte cells, which is enough to play with computationally. So we'll do that as fast as we can. But the problem was, you know, there's just not enough and we can't keep doing this. So what we decided to do was grow up airway epithelium, as you all have, I see Scott Randell in the audience, as you all have done for a long time. And then we single cell sequence the airway epithelium, hoping to find a model where we might enrich rare cells. And the short answer is, you know, we found everything. And interestingly, including rare cells, and interestingly enough, the small airway epithelium has ionocytes. Okay, that's been a point of debate, but the small airway epithelium in our in vitro cultures had ionocytes. So the question is, is that real or not? And it could, it could just be an in vitro artifact. You put distal airway epithelium into a dish and it does funny things. So, but when we counted them, at least in the air liquid interface cultures, the large and the small airway, they, they were statistically indistinguishable. Um, and then we have this, and uh, I hope this is of utility to many of you. Um, Avinash worked very hard to try to find an enrichment strategy. It turns out we have a pretty simple one. It's not that great, but it's very helpful. You take away blood cells, you take away endothelial cells, you select for epithelial cells, and then you select for C-kit. And if you do that, you can substantially increase the number of rare cells. For some reason or another, the neuroendocrine cells won't survive this. They're enriched, but they, they don't survive well. But you can get the ionocytes, and you can get the pre-ionocytes. So now, when we look at the single cell sequencing that we get from the alley, we see that the distal airway ionocytes express CFTR. Uh, Viral Shah in my lab was thinking about how to quantify rare cells, and the literature suggested that the distal airway epithelium simply didn't have ionocytes. And then since CF starts as a small airways disease, it might be that the ionocytes essentially have no role in cystic fibrosis, at least at that level, which remains a possibility. I mean, I don't think any of us know because we haven't done the perfect experiment unless John and John have done it. Um, but an important thing to realize is this culture media really matters. Um, if you grow the distal airway epithelium, the distal airway epithelium in small airways media from this company, Stem Cell Tech, not an advertisement, but that's the media that we use, Stem Cell Tech. If you grow the distal airway epithelium in the small airway epithelial culture medium, you will not get ionocytes. But if you paradoxically grow the distal airway epithelium in the large airway culture media, you get ionocytes. So use the large airway epithelial media. Um, the next thing Viral wanted to do was, he, this becomes the problem of sampling. When you have cells that are this poorly represented, it's just hard to, do, it's hard to say anything about them quantitatively. So Viral des decided that he just has to go to the whole lung, essentially. And in Iowa, he learned how to do this from his colleagues. 
Uh, and then he decided the only way to quantify these cells is whole mount imaging. And when you do whole mount imaging, you see that there are distal ionocytes. Um, and Viral now has done whole mount imaging on three people. You see how many uh, regions, he's sampled 26 large regions and 33 small airway regions in just three patients. I mean, this stuff is very hard to do and we can keep adding more and more data over time, but you can see he's imaged about 1.68 square millimeters in the large airway and 2.14 millimeters squared in the small airway. That's a lot of cells, but it's still biased in terms of sampling. The key thing I want you to take away from here is there's no difference in the number of small airway and large airway ionocytes as much as we can tell, right? But the human lung is huge and these cells are very rare. And even in these patients, just three, we've only sampled a fraction. So I think we just still don't know. And it's gonna remain a very difficult problem because the cells are so rare, you'd have to sample an entire human lung to really know what's going on. It's just tough. But nearest to our ability to tell, these small and large airway ionocytes have the same gene expression pattern. I intentionally blurred this so you couldn't look at the genes because this came out like two days ago. But you can see that the pattern is more or less the same. I'm sure there's some interesting differences, and this will all be downloaded to the publicly available databases. But by and large, they're the same. Uh, so then we go back, right? What is that POU23 progenitor that I've described? The thing is, it's, it's not associated with any mature cell. Um, it exists by staining with protein antibody in the large airway, um, and by RNA velocity, a computational technique, there's a suggestion that the POU2F3 progenitor becomes an ionocyte. Okay, that's based on aggregate gene expression. Then we did cell cycle analysis on that, and it looks like the POU23F progenitors are KI67 positive. That means there's an ionocyte progenitor that replicates in the human large airway epithelium. Then we did a tax seek, so we looked at the epigenetic level because the chromatin presages the gene expression. And when we did that, this is the, what I showed you at RNA-seq level, but when we do single cell attack seq, we see another cluster. And that cluster, I mean, there's the neuroendocrine cells, there's the ionocyte, there's the progenitor I've described, and then there's a pre-ionocyte. Uh, that's like directly in line and it has unique gene expression signatures. You can see the PLU2F3 progenitor shutting down and the ionocyte opening up. But the mature ionocyte genes are not yet expressed in the pre-ionocyte. But I think it's clearly the progenitor cell population. It's acting developmentally and mechanistically like an ionocyte progenitor. Um, so this is the thing. We reanalyzed we re information from the nose, and it turns out that all comes from stem cells. That's where I thought the ionocyte was going to come from. But it looks like in the human large airway epithelium, the ionocyte comes from a precursor cell, not directly from a basal stem cell, which may or may not influence uh, gene therapy because you can still get the basal cell, which is probably the parent of the progenitor cell. Nonetheless, this is the lineage. Then I'm gonna shift gears and just talk about a completely different kind of story, um, which is, you know, we're really interested in man, not so much the mouse, for the reason that all of you know. We use the mouse because it's a very tractable developmental biology system. Um, the gene expression of human ionocytes is quite different. Um, so I'm going to tell you this, how can you study human cells? So the first thing I thought about a while ago is we can't put fluorophores into human cells. We can't track them, and that's what developmental biologists like to do. And the only way to do it then is to take human cells out, genetically modify them, and recreate an airway epithelium. But you lose all tertiary complex structure. So we had an idea which is, can we just look at autofluorescence, the thing that we all try to get rid of? But we looked at the autofluorescence of NADPH, you know, redox metabolism, and FAD, because we reasoned that those should be biologically significant autofluorescent molecules. 
So we've, I was happy, two days ago we posted this to BioXRV, BioArchives, I guess. Um, and if you guys want to find it, you can just find it now and try to use this technique. But basically, uh, Viral and Vlad Vinarsky, who's here somewhere in the audience, dissect out a trachea and put it onto a dish. And then they do two photon microscopy, looking for autofluorescence, not fluorescence. Um, and what I, I'll show you, this is just eye candy for the purposes of this lecture. But the left is a ciliated cell stain, and the right is just pure autofluorescence. So you can just pick out the ciliated cells by autofluorescence. Ditto with the secretory cells, and ditto with the basal stem cells. So the common cells done, you don't need a fluorophore. And that's pretty darn easy. Um, the and you can see, you know, we can do this mathematically. But we should now be able to do label-free imaging of mouse without fluorophores, which even in mouse is incredibly helpful. Um, but then the rare cells are, rare cells are just hard in every possible way. And it turns out even when you do autofluorescence imaging, they look a lot alike. And this is because I sh think they share a deep evolutionary commonality. But for whatever reason, they look a lot alike on autofluorescence signature. And I'm not showing the NE cell, but it's just hard to distinguish. But the dots, the NED dots and the FAD dots are different. That makes sense, right? These are redox molecules. They are segregated to organelles like mitochondria. So you can imagine that cell biologically, you know, cells that are loaded with vesicles or cells that are loaded with mitochondria, like ionocytes, would have different dots. So what Viral did, along with a computational colleague, would just think about the way dots could be distributed and the way that cells could be morphologically analyzed, like the height, the width, the diameter, and the dot distribution, for lack of a better term. So this on the left is that single cell sequencing I showed you. And this on the right is the same kind of analysis with the FAD, NAD, autofluorescent signature, and superimposed on that is the morphological analysis. And you can now segregate all of the rare cells too. This is harder, and we're gonna try to work on machine learning algorithms to make this automated, but, and I don't know how long that's gonna take. It is tricky. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to identify ionocytes in human tissue from biopsy specimens. But that's a work in progress, um, and we'd, we'd like to make that increasingly better. And I'll just end with a, just a fun thing about what this can do. Viral noticed that there were cells, when you added methacholine, their autofluorescence signatures would change. And the strange thing is these secretory cells seem to develop these black voids in them. Viral then took a, a, a mouse where the membranes were labeled with the, the fluorophore TD tomato, and he added a dextran that was labeled with Fitzy. What you can see is those voids are actually dextran laden, but surrounded by membrane. So what we think that means is that these voids are created by the uptake of luminal substance into vesicles. All right, that's the conclusion. And I'll just end with this movie, um, which I, I think sort of is fun. Uh, and this is a movie that Viral took of that methacholine induction of secretory cells. And this is hard, the lights might need to be go down, but the dramatic event you will see. So the parts of it, I think if the lights were down, what you would see is that the Fitzy dextran comes down the sides of the goblet cell and then starts floating through the cytoplasm. And only after that is there a massive exocytosis event. So presaging the massive exocytosis event, you are intaking luminal substance into the secretory cells. And there is an analogy in the gut called goblet cell associated passages. And that is a, an attempt to, by the goblet cell to sample the lumen and then provide antigen to the dendritic cell. 
So we've fancifully called these things secretory cell-associated passages. But morphologically, it is so similar to what see, what's seen in the gut that I'd be very surprised if they're not subtending the same function. But that's the kind of stuff I think we can do now by just looking. Looking at unlabeled tissue, which is what's really exciting. So the takeaways, um, ionocytes are present in the large and human small airways, presumably to the same degree. Ionocytes don't come from basal cells. They come from an uncommitted replicating POU2, 3F progenitor. There is a pre-ionocyte stage. Please use the right culture methods if you're going to study ionocytes in the distal airway epithelium. We have a fax-based protocol with C-Kit, so you can isolate your ionocytes and enrich them. And all of this stuff will be deposited. The next thing is that we can identify our ionocytes, although it's still hard, in tissue without labels using autofluorescence. And that's published, and you can look at it and hopefully improve on it. Um, we think that secretory cells actually, as they secrete, are also sampling the lumen. And we guess that they are, at, in that same moment, where they're dealing with whatever the problem is, they're also trying to figure out what the problem is and then provide that contents to the immune system. That's, of course, a fanciful hypothesis, but that's what I think is happening based on what's happening in the gut. Uh, and then the final thing is, you know, we may be able to use, the reason I wanted to do label-free imaging was to try to image human tissue. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, in relatively short order and actually pick out the cell types uh, that one, we're trying to study. So then let me just say, I mean, I'm incredibly indebted to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, particularly because I'm not a CF clinician or a, a CF biologist. Um, but, and I wanted to point out actually that uh, Viral actually got the Leroy Matthews Award. And I read the history and it's really just amazing. I mean, cystic fibrosis is a model for all of the rest of pulmonology and maybe all, all of the rest of human disease treatment. And it's to, Viral was actually trained in Mike Welsh's lab. So maybe in the next couple of years, we'll be ab actually able to tell you more about human airway ionocyte physiology. And I did also want to say that the label-free imaging wasn't done just by Viral, but a uh, postdoc of mine, Vlad Vinarsky, who's now uh, actually at Vertex, sort of completing the circle. And then finally, I'll say that Avinash uh, Wagre on the left um, performed the abundance of the single cell sequencing experiments that identified the ionocyte progenitor. And the work just could not have been done without Aviv Regev and, uh, and Alex Sankoff, who provided all the computational expertise. And I'll just uh, end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have all the questions at the end of every, um, all the speakers. Thank you, Jay, for that amazing talk. Um, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Engelhart, who is the professor and head of the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology and professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at University of Iowa. He's also the Roy J. Carver Chair in Molecular Medicine. And I'm extremely excited to hear his talk today on defining cellular function of the pulmonary anocytes using genetic ferret models. And I might ask somebody to turn on the lights for you. Yeah, do they, do they have them? Something in the back that can turn the lights on? Only in the... Let's see. Laser pointer. All right, great. All right, I'd like to thank uh, AP and Ruby for the invitation to speak. Uh, let's see. These are my disclosures. So I always like to start because I get a lot of questions about why ferret. And I'm going to be talking about the ferret and my focus on advantages in the ferret really comes from the cellular anatomy and structure in the lung. So the, all these large species here have cartila cartilaginous airways that contain submucosal glands. And there are basically four trophic units that have unique cell types in each of them. Now rodents and rabbits um, uh, don't have respiratory bronchioles, 
Rats and mice only have glands in the trachea or upper end of the trachea, and rabbits have no glands. So the cell tech I'm going to be talking about that Jay gave the great lead into are pulmonary ionocytes, and these exist in airways that, that I've studied that contain submucosal glands, the proximal airway. Now, cell types within the proximal airway between mouse, ferret, and human differ. Uh, both contain ionocytes where glands are present. In the proximal airway, the, the majority of the secretory cells have a goblet cell phenotype uh, with club cells in the distal airway. But in mice, club cells are, are present throughout all levels of the conducting airway. Now, these are the cellular targets for gene therapy that express CFTR, and there's still a lot of controversy about functionally how CFTR functions in each of them. And as Jay mentioned, um, the collaboration we had um, with uh, discovering ionocytes intrigued me that ionocytes could contain 50% of CFTR in the proximal airway, but they're only 1% of the cell type in that particular region. So we hypothesized that species-specific differences in the biology of and distribution of pulmonary ionocytes may affect disease progression. And as Jay showed in his paper, there's a critical transcription factor called FOXI1 that's required for specification of ionocytes. And so in FOXI1 knockout polarized airway epithelia in vitro, if you knock out FOXI1, you get an increased current, uh, chloride current, or bicarbonate current. This is using symmetrical buffers. Um, and Jay had, we had seen this in Jay's paper. So we were interested in, in developing ferret models that could help us address the biology of the ionocyte in a species that contain glands and ionocyte throughout the proximal airways. And so we've developed multiple ways to genetically engineer ferrets using uh, zygote injection and CRISPR-Cas9. I'm going to be talking about four different types of transgenic ferrets that utilize conditional genetics and Cree drivers um, and how we're using these to dissect ionocyte function. So the first approach was fairly easy. This was just knock out FOXI1 and then interrogate the epithelium. Two very talented uh, trainees here worked on this project, knocked out FOXI1 with CRISPR-Cas9, produced no protein in the kidney, which contains abundant um, intercalated cells that are like ionocytes and perform similar functions, likely. And we see uh, the absence of ionocyte marker here in kidney and FOXI1 knockout ferrets. And interestingly, these, kid the, these ferrets are very fragile. They develop cystic kidneys, very difficult to rear. And then additionally, in the airway, in these sections around phosphatining, using this ionocyte marker, we see there are no ionocytes within the FOXI1 knockout trachea. Now, if you take primary basal cells from both wild type and FOXI1 knockout, polarize them, you can't visually see significant differences between ciliated cells, uh, secretory cells here. But if you look at the mRNA level, FOXI1 knockout uh, ALI cultures lack these ionocyte markers. They are reduced in about 50% of CFTR mRNA, which you might remember that, but really no changes in these markers for the other cell types. So if you look, again, using symmetrical currents uh, to look at chloride bicarbonate-free or bicarbonate currents with chloride-free buffers, one sees a significant decrease uh, in FOXI1 knockout um, conductance. This is just quantified here. It's about 67% reduction for the Forskoll and IBMX inducible. Small changes in uh, resistance, but you can, we did see that within the chloride conditions. So pulmonary ionocytes influence anion current in polarized tracheal epithelia from ferrets, but not from mice. So what other properties might be affected in the absence of pulmonary ionocytes? So there are uh, several major defects uh, that can be interrogated in, in air-liquid interface cultures and in vivo. And there's wide acceptance that there's decreased uh, air, airway surface liquid height, a decrease in pH and the ability to alkalinize, and de an increase in viscosity as a result of this. So we interrogated this uh, using a method where you add a small volume to an air-liquid interface culture allowed to equilibrate for 24 hours and then measure the ASL height. And what you can see here, this is using a fluorescent dye, what you can see here is that the equilibrated ASL height of wild types is about 17, and both FOXI1 knockout as well as CFTR knockout ALI cultures are dehydrated. 
Similarly, ASL pH was changed in, you can see, uh, there was a failure to alkalinize following Forskoll and IBMX stimulation here for wild type. Here is significantly lower for FOXA1 knockout, similar in CFTR knockout. But CFTR knockout cultures had a baseline uh, uh, acidic def or defect, more acidic ASL than FOXI1 knockout. So that's something that, that the, the ionocytes were not responsible for. ASL viscosity using FRAP and fluorescent recovery showed that there was increased viscosity in the ASL of both FOXI1 knockout and CFTR knockout, although slightly more severe but not significant in the CFTR knockout. So loss of pulmonary ionocytes partially phenocopies ASL properties seen in CF proximal airway, so the reduced ASL pH volume as well as increased viscosity. So the obvious question is, is mucociliary clearance defective in vivo in FOXI1 knockout ferrets? So we utilized a method, a gadolinium albumin conjugate and spec CT, where this radioactivity was deposited down at the carina with a fairly small volume, squirted it in, and we looked at mucociliary clearance. I'm showing you three examples of studies just to convince you that, that we can actually assay CFTR-dependent clearance. So here are a CFG551D ferrets on the CFTR modulator VX770, so that corrects the CFTR gating defect. And these are taking off for four weeks. And here is wild type. <clears throat> so if you, if you quantify this and map this out over time, you can see that baseline measurements in CF G551 DCF animals, good clearance. It's equivalent to, to wild type. And progressively, as you take them off VX770, they lose clearance. If you put them back on, they regain clearance. And this is just graphed over here for a little bit easier to visualize. So this assay can, can measure CFTR-dependent um, mucociliary clearance in the ferret. So what's the mucociliary clearance in FOXI1 knockout? Well, it was equivalent to that seen in CFTR knockout here in the bottom two lines as compared to wild type and CF animals, or sorry, that's not CFTR knockout, it's G551D animals taken off VX770. And the, the G551D ferrets maintained on VX770 had clearance that was comparable to wild type. And here it is just quantified really indistinguishable between the CF animals taken off CFTR modulator and the FOX at one knockout. So FOX at one knockout ferrets, uh, their ALI culture has reduced ASL volume and enhanced mucus viscosity, and this leads to an impair, uh, impaired tracheal mucociliary clearance similar to what's seen in CF ferrets. So what other new genetic models might be useful in interrogating pulmonary ionocyte function? Now, one of the goals of my lab is to be able to walk through all the CFTR expressing cell types and either start with a normal epithelium and conditionally knock out CFTR only in one particular cell type, or start out with a CF animal and conditionally knock in CFTR into these cell types. Here, just showing ionocytes and secretory cells. You know, this can model basically gene editing, or if you overexpress CFTR, model a gene addition approach. So I'm going to talk about the application of this approach here. So those of you that aren't familiar with conditional genetics in mice, it has really re revolutionized biomedicine for the last 30 years. One of the foundational things about these approaches are the ability to induce genetic changes in the nucleus with a prodrug, here inducing a fusion of an estrogen receptor to a Cree recombinase that recognizes 38 base pair sequence. Upon the addition of tamoxifen, this moves to the nucleus and it can cleave sequences or invert sequences between two LOX B sites, depending on what their sequence is. So to functionally interrogate CFTR and pulmonary ionocytes, we created three genetic models here. One's a, a Cree reporter. So this changes from tomato to EGFP when you induce Cree with tamoxifen. The other is the FOXI1 Cree driver here knocked into the three prime and translated the FOXI1 gene and then a conditional knockout locus um, that, that has LOXP sites surrounding exon 16. <clears throat> and what you can see here are lineage trace ionocytes within a ferret using these top two models that turn green. And we've bred this onto the uh, 
onto the conditional CFTR knockout, so these cells would lack CFTR after induction. So what does mucociliary clearance look like in conditional knockout ferrets? And thus far, we've only been able to uh, complete two. These are studies where we first measured baseline mucociliary clearance in the same animals that were then induced with tamoxifen and then measured a clearance afterwards and significantly decreased. So CFTR expression in pulmonary ionocytes is required for effective MCC. So the question, uh, do ionocytes directly transport anions, or do they serve some sensory function that um, activates surrounding cells to transport, transport anions? It's one of the questions we wanted to address. So we return to our um, conditional uh, FOXI1 Cree primary tracheal cells, and in collaboration with Alan Berkman, we created a lentivirus that harbored a YFP halide sensor uh, in front or behind a lock stop lock. So if you induce Cree, you excise DS red and you activate expression of this halide sensor. So what's the utility of this halide sensor? Well, in the presence of chloride, it's not quenched. If you switch to iodide, it becomes quenched and you can measure the extent to which um, a halide, iodide is moving into a cell at a single cell level. So we polarized these cells for 14 days and do with tamoxifen and then interrogated them um, uh, using a number of different conditions I'm going to talk about. So indeed, um, these are cells that were treated with ethanol or hydroxytamoxifen. Here you can see ionocytes um, are, are turning yellow. And so the goal of this study was to image many ionocytes following various buffer changes. Now the control buffer was chloride to chloride. There should be no quenching in that case. And indeed, that's this top line right here. You see very little quenching. A chloride to iodide, which you'll see when this flips up here, you'll start to see quenching in the presence of Forskolin and IBMX. We saw quenching when we switched to iodide, and this is apically applied. And then chloride to iodide, in the presence of GLI-H101, which inhibits CFTR and CFTR activators for Skull and IBMX, you see an intermediate inhibition as compared to in the presence of chloride alone. In the important experiment, where conditional CFTR knockout primary basal cells also transduced with this halide reporter, um, when we perform this maneuver here, we lose all quenching, demonstrating that CFTR is responsible for movement of iodide in through the apical membrane. And this is just quantification of all these various conditions. And here are the conditional knockouts, very pretty close to the control chloride to chloride switch. Oop, I think I went backwards. So the lack of ionocytes leads to reduced chloride and bicarbonate conductance, dehydrated ASL, failure of the ASL to alkal alkalinize following CFTR stimulation and enhanced mucus viscosity in the ASL. And ionocytes also directly transport anions. So how can such an extremely infrequent cell type, which is about 0.5% in ALI cultures, have such a large impact on ASL regulation? And we've thought long and hard about this. I don't think we completely understand uh, all this biology, and I'm hoping John Hanrahan is going <laughs> to correct me in his talk. But there are basically two mechanisms, all right? Either the ionocyte is, is cell autonomously transports salt or chloride, bicarbonate, sodium follows pericellularly, and that moves fluid. And it does so in a cell autonomous manner. Or it's possible that uh, ionocytes that have very long appendages communicate um, with other, other cells, and that gap junctions help ionocytes to bulk move all the anions across the epithelium. And here's, here's an example of an ionocyte here, probably two. You can just see in an ALI culture at least touching 20, 25 cells. So what unique channels and gap junctional proteins define pulmonary ionocyte function? We're interested in what channels are different um, in mouse ionocytes. So we performed single cell sequencing experiments, and I'm not going to go into great detail about these, but one goal was to compare FOXI1 knockout to wild type. Another goal was to fax enrich GFP positive ionocytes, mix them back with tomato cells at, at a certain percentage, and then sequence those to enrich the number of ionocytes that we could obtain. And indeed, 
we get the UMAPs, just like Jay was showing, with three um, uh, rare cell clusters here in the pulmonary ionocytes. Uh, these share transcriptional signatures, rare, rare cells sharing closer signatures, uh, secretory and goblet cell uh, sharing signatures. And the more important thing, these are just channels that were enriched in the various cell types that I have listed here. And what you can see are that a number of channels here, here's CFTR, but also ENAC, sodium potassium ATP, PAs, NKCC1, basal lateral K channel, all these channels are required to move salt and fluid across an epithelium that pumps chloride. Another interesting finding was the fact that we saw uh, three different subsets of pulmonary ionocytes. Intriguing, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the pathways, but I'll, I'll cite the, um, the talk later that you might be able to see online. I think it's occurring right now. But some of these were enriched in channels that you think would move uh, fluid, uh, ENAC, uh, alpha subunit, beta subunit. And if you want to hear more on, on these subsets, I uh, encourage you to attend the, the talks listed here in the poster. So in summary, rare pulmonary ionocytes appear to have previous unrecognized subsites, subtypes. This is similar to intercalated cells and ionocytes in fish gill and frog skin. And despite the low abundance, pulmonary ionocytes contribute to a significant amount of anion conductance in the proximal airway. Pulmonary ionocytes are also important for regulating ASL pH, volume, and mucus viscosity, and clearance in the proximal airway. One area I won't speak to, but you can visit these posters or the workshop talk, are that we're, we're very interested in where the stem cell for these ionocytes are derived, and we have some evidence that submucosal glands, which also house their own ionocytes, may have a specialized progenitor that specifies ionocytes for the surface airway epithelium, at least in the cartilaginous gland-containing proximal airways. Now, I, I, this type of work in larger animals takes an army. Um, I'm really indebted to, to all those within my group that have participated. Um, Adam Haber has been just fantastic with the bioinformatics, and I, and I encourage you to attend Fong Yang's talk and other collaborators and indebted to Jay for bringing me on as a collaborator when we first discovered him you know, about five years ago now. So thank you. John, I thought that was such um, intriguing data and we already have a lot of questions coming in, but we're holding all questions until the end. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. John Harrahan, who is a professor of physiology at McGill University in Montreal and the director of the CCF Translational Research Center. And I really look forward to his talk entitled The Quest for Granularity in Airway Ion Transport. Right, well, I'd like to start by thanking uh, AP and Ruby for the invitation to speak today and be part of this exciting session. It's great to be giving talks in person again, and I feel a little bit uncomfortable because our work was motivated by the other speakers in the session, so it's kind of like I'm following on, trying to, uh, trying to understand how the uh, airway epithelium might work based on, on starting with their work. Um, <clears throat> if I can, uh, how do I change this slide now? This is... Maybe this way. Okay. Good. Yeah, so as Jay pointed out in the first talk, there's um, been an explosion of, of research on uh, single cell transcriptomes in the last few years. They've revealed the complexity in the multiple cell types and their variable distributions. 
Um, the different major cell types have been known for 150 years, but this complexity really has only become fully appreciated recently uh, thanks to single-cell RNA-seq and related techniques. It's raised many questions uh, as to how the epithelium works. For example, CFTR expression is relatively low in goblet cells, and it's usually not detected in cell sections. Um, but some years ago, we isolated granules from well-differentiated HBE cells and found co-localization of MUC5AC and CFTR in single vesicles. Um, that was uh, kind of a surprising result, and it's gratifying uh, that single-cell RNA-seq has, in fact, uh, confirmed uh, that um, mucin-expressing uh, cells also contain, can also extain, uh, contain CFTR. And to, together, they support the idea that maybe we should be looking at uh, pre-release mucins for, for differences uh, uh, since CFTR is present in the same cells. CFTR is uh, highly expressed, as, as was pointed out previously, in ionocytes and moderately expressed in, uh, in multiple secretory and basal cell subtypes. So the question is, does CFTR function similarly in all these different cell types, and is it regulated the same way? Um, we don't know the answer to that. And what are the function of those, uh, functions of those ionocytes? That's, uh, as, as was um, discussed in the previous talk, um, it has several hundred-fold higher levels of CFTR in the ionocyte, but its functions are really not clear at this point. We also have to wonder about CFTR interactomes, and um, they've been reported in various cell lines, but how do they relate to well-differentiated uh, airway epithelium where the interactors may be in different cell types? I think that's another question that needs to be uh, addressed. So this beautiful data uh, motivated us then to look at FOXI1. It's a major transcription factor involved in the development of pulmonary ionocytes, and it's also uh, important in intercalated cells in the kidney, clear cells in the epididymis, and the four cells of the inner ear. And uh, although there's almost certainly other factors involved, FOXI1 looked like a really good um, uh, target for us to work with and try to uh, do physiological studies on, on the, um, on the uh, ionocytes. So it's a, mem it's a member of the 4 kid box family of transcription factors, and it's needed for expression of, of both the proton ATPase, the vacuolar proton ATPase, and SLC26A4, or Pendrin, in multiple tissues. Full differentiation of the HBE cells requires several weeks at the air-liquid interface, and FOXI1 is probably delayed with respect to some other uh, uh, genes that are turned on based on the appearance of the ionocyte markers. This was uh, pointed out in this, in this paper by Goldfarb Murin uh, in 2020. Uh, the ionocyte markers appear later, so we hypothesize that perhaps forced expression of FOXI1 might compress this time scale. Uh, time course and allow functional studies of the ionocytes after FOXI1 is induced transiently, transiently expressed from, a, from an adenoviral vector. So we've, and based on our experience with CFTR, we've used CFTR and adenoviral vectors before a lot, and usually um, the expression starts off very high and then it starts to decline after about seven days. And, even at 10 days, though, it's still um, at a level it's comparable to that of wild-type cells when we do um, uh, viral uh, transduction, trans transductions. So we decided to try this and see if we could get FOXI1 expressing cells from the adenovirus. Um, and we made these adenoviruses either to contain just EGFP or FOXI1 with a, uh, with a ribosome entry sequence in between um, um, the FOXI1 and EGFP. And uh, we uh, in infected the cells, uh, these are HBE cells, and found that we got an increase in the number of FOXI1 positive cells per square millimeter uh, of about tenfold after transduction with the virus. At the same time that the, um, the uh, number of cells increased tenfold, this was accompanied by a 30 to 200 fold increase in the number of transcripts for two other ionocyte markers, the transcription factor AS. CL3 and also uh, a vacuolar proton ATPA subunit, and a tenfold increase in the amount of CFTR uh, transcripts as well. But importantly, there was no change at all in the uh, markers that we tested for secretory basal goblet or ciliated cells. So it seemed like we were inducing something that looks rather like a ionocyte by doing the um, uh, FOXI1 transduction. 
At the protein level, the endogenous CFTR immunostaining was increased by expressing FOXI1, and it was detected in most, but not all, of the green cells. So we were able to um, um, show in Western blots that CFTR protein increased about two and a half fold relative to tubulin in, in, in the Western blots. So for functional studies, we mounted the, um, these transduced cultures in Ussing chambers, and uh, we measured uh, for and stimulated short circuit currents. And the FOXI1 uh, transduced cells uh, had increased basal currents about twofold higher than, than controls that were transduced only with the EGFP. And this was both before and after the addition of amiloride. And the amiloride sensitive currents uh, were also increased about twofold in, in, in these cells. The increase in the basal current was apparent from the, the larger inhibitory, the INH172 response relative to the force colon uh, stimulated current. And so we found it convenient just to plot the ratio of these to show that the FOXI1 cells showed a higher uh, inhibition by, by INH172 compared to force colon presumably due to the inhibition of the basal current, which was elevated prior to the addition of forscolin. The FOXI1-dependent conductance that was induced when the, when the cells were transduced um, was apically localized based on um, the fact that if you permeabilize the basal lateral membrane with nystatin, uh, there's a, a, about a fourfold increase in the uh, basal uh, reverse chloride current when you have a chloride to basal lateral, um, apical to basal lateral chloride gradient. So it's, it's clearly um, uh, increased at the apical membrane, and it was further stimulated by the addition of forscolin. So if you had forscolin and the, the currents in the FOXI1 transduced cultures, which we assume are enriched for ionocytes, uh, was uh, larger compared to controls. So this, this, uh, this basically confirms what we expected, that, that the, fo the FOXI1 is acting on an apical cyclic AMP-stimulated conductance, at least uh, for most of this uh, um, um, response that we're measuring in the short circuit current measurements. And again, we had this ratio of uh, INH172 to forscolin responses increased in the FOXI1 cells due to the elevated basal current that was present before the addition of forscolin. One interesting thing is that we, um, this, is, this is strange, I've lost my notes here. Oh. Uh, in, we routinely, uh, in, in these experiments, uh, uh, test the viability of the cultures at the end, especially when there's negative results by adding, um, by adding a purinergic agonist such as ATP and measuring the calcium activated chloride currents which uh, are transiently um, uh, evoked by the, by the purinergic stimulation. And uh, we noticed that when we did this with the uh, FOXI1 transduced cells, we always, uh, the calcium activated chloride current that was stimulated by ATP was always preceded by this rapid uh, transient current in the opposite direction, suggesting there was another conductance which was being uh, turned on uh, in the FOX, specifically in the FOXI1 transduced cells. So there's a number of potassium channels that have been proposed, and there's some potassium secretion that occurs in the airway epithelium. Uh, KCNN4, for example, and, and BK uh, potassium channels have both been uh, uh, demonstrated in the apical membrane. So we, um, <clears throat> we looked at the effects of a specific inhibitor of BK potassium channels, paxilin, and it completely abolished this transient current in the ionocyte-enriched uh, cultures suggesting that uh, the FOXI1 was inducing BK potassium channels, which uh, contribute this transient current um, uh, in, in, in the cultures. Another gene that was upregulated in the FOXI1 transduced cells was the adenyl cyclase 5. Um, it was it's a differentially expressed gene in ionocytes, and, um, and, it was, uh, and we confirmed that in our cultures it was elevated after transduction with the adenovirus. The other curious thing, though, was that when we looked at the dose response curve for forscolin in these transduced cultures, the maximal stimulation um, by forscolin was not increased after FOXI1 transduction, even though there was a five fold, or there was uh, a several fold increase in the uh, expression of the adenyl cyclase and CFTR both, the, the, the maximal current that could be evoked by, 
by forskolin uh, was not significantly different in the transduced cells. When we used it instead of forskolin, a CPT cyclic AMP, which is a phosphodiesterase resistant cyclic AMP analog, which is membrane permeant and used a lot for these kinds of experiments, we did see a huge increase in the, in the, in the short circuit current uh, stimulated by CPT cyclic AMP. And that sort of hinted that perhaps CFTR is differentially regulated in ionocytes compared to other secretory cells due to uh, alterations in phosphodiesterase activity. So we looked at phosphodiesterases with qPCR to try and see if there was any alterations in, in PDE um, expression. And there was a, a seven-fold in increase in the expression of PDE1C, which is important for coupling uh, in the, in the uh, sub-membrane compartment. Uh, in, has been shown in several cell types. This was very interesting. So PDE1C looks like um, it's upregulated in the ion ionocytes, and that might account for why the maximal stimulation by forskolin wasn't increased despite increases in adenylcyclase and CFTR levels. <clears throat> the basal level of cyclic AMP measured globally um, was not altered in the FOXI1 transduced cultures. It was, uh, it was the same. That's not unusual to see no change in the global cyclic AMP because its signaling is mostly uh, localized and a very, very spatially important uh, localization. But how, uh, when we added an inhibitor, which is specific for PDE1C, which is uh, well known, ITI214, then uh, we did see uh, a, a change in cyclic AMP levels, but only in the FOXI1 and transduced cells. So in other words, um, inhibiting um, this phosphodiesterase 1C only had an effect on cyclic AMP after they were transduced with, uh, with FOXI1. It had no effect on the untransduced control cells. And when we mounted the, uh, the transduced cells in, in, in Osing chambers and measured the effects of IT14 uh, without any other agonists, adding the inhibitor of the phosphodiesterase was able to stimulate short circuit current, whereas it had no effect on the control EGFP transduced cells, suggesting that, um, that not only is it upregulated and, 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 and affecting uh, cyclic AMP levels, but it's also functionally important for regulating CFTR. So this is a difference between ionocytes and the other secretory cells which are contributing to the short circuit currents that we're measuring transepithelially. The problem with Osing chambers, although they're great, it's a great technique that we use all the time, um, they, um, they don't give a clear picture of physiologic role. And so we recently began studying functional, uh, functional characteristics of the FOXI1 cultures at the air liquid interface with basolateral perfusion. And CFTR conducts bicarbonate, and one might expect that cyclic AMP uh, stimulation would cause alkalinization of the airway surface liquid. When we um, mounted the cells in, these, in, the, in this chamber, so we have an air liquid interface here with a pH sensor and the, the airway surface liquid, a uh, small volume of which we add, uh, which contains sodium chloride and bicarbonate and air. It's air equilibrated. The basal lateral side contains 150 sodium chloride, bicarbonate, and 5% and CO2. We find that uh, the pH gradually declines over time. And when we stimulate uh, CFTR ostensibly with cyclic AMP or CPT cyclic AMP, instead of getting an alkalinization due to bicarbonate secretion, which we expected, we actually, in the transduced cells, got an acidification of the airway surface liquid. So I'm saying something very heretical now. I'm going to get in trouble. But, uh, but, the, but clearly, we're stimulating proton secretion, not bicarbonate secretion with cyclic AMP under these conditions. And, that's shown and summarized over here for, for five or six preparations. So the, the rate of uh, um, uh, pH decline in the EGFP cells is shown here. And then uh, with FOXI1, it's increased. And then if you add baflomycin, an inhibitor of the proton secretion through the vacuole or proton pump, you get a abolish, you abolish that increase in the uh, acidification on the, uh, on the apical side. So we think it's important to understand how bicarbonate's working, and it's more complicated than we had thought. Um, 
And the reason we think bicarbonate is really important is, and, and this is a plug for a talk that I have to give tomorrow morning on uh, airway surface liquid uh, pH oscillations. We found that there are very large pH oscillations when we breathe on the airway surface in which the pH actually goes up to around 9 each time we breathe in and then goes back down to about 7.4 when we breathe out. And if you hold your breath, then, um, then it stays, it stays uh, um, alkaline for a while, and then it decays, presumably because CO2 is building up. And then when you exhale, um, then um, you get uh, acidification down to about 7.5. And our model for that is, is, is very simple, just Henderson Hasselbalch, basically, CO2 is going into solution. It equilibrates very rapidly with the with a very microscopic uh, layer of fluid, which uh, in the presence of carbonic anhydrase can uh, be converted into an acid, which acidifies the cells, uh, the airway surface. So we think that it's important to study acid base on the airway epithelium in the presence of bicarbonate, which is uh, your worst nightmare if you're trying to study proton fluxes, because the bicarbonate obviously is a buffer and makes it uh, more difficult. So to get around that, we've um, uh, tried to come up with a method for measuring proton transport in the presence of bicarbonate. And basically, this involves uh, modeling uh, with the differential equations the different reactions that make up carbonic anhydrate, the carbonic acid uh, uh, reactions. And um, we have a, 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 a basically a calculator which we can input measured uh, uh, pH values over time and calculate the proton fluxes in the presence of bicarbonate, since bicarbonate is changing with time as protons are being secreted. And this is just an illustration of the, of the output of the calculator using, uh, using a mock artificial uh, 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 surface liquid um, and containing bicarbonate at uh, 25 millimolar at the beginning of the experiment and transduced with either GFP or with FOXI1 plus GFP. And you can see that the proton secretion rates are higher with the, um, with the FOXI1 transduced cells. And so the idea is to use this method now, this calculator, to be able to study proton fluxes in the presence of bicarbonate, which we think is really important uh, for the airway surface liquid, which is an open buffered bicarbonate solution. The other thing we're trying to do, which Jay alluded to earlier, is to actually sort the EGFP cells. Since we're growing the cells and they have a, an adenovirus that contains EGFP, we should, in theory, at least be able to, to select um, and use cell sorting to uh, enrich our cultures for, for ionocytes. And we're, it's, a, it's a challenge to get enough cells to do even the transcriptome bulk uh, RNA-seq on these uh, uh, sorted cells, but that's what we're working on at the moment. We're trying to, uh, tr trying to get enough cells that we can do that and also hopefully do functional studies on the purified uh, ionocyte-like cells, which I'll call them ionocyte-like at the, at the moment until we know for sure. We think they're ionocytes. But, um, <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, the role of ionocytes uh, in anion and acid-base transport, we think, is more complex than, than we first, first thought. Uh, FOXI1 increases basal and cyclic AMP-stimulated currents that are mediated by CFTR and also uh, BK potassium currents. Paradoxically, uh, forced ionocyte differentiation doesn't increase the maximum CFTR current despite higher expression of both CFTR and adenyl cyclase 5, and that's probably due to the upregulation of PDE1C in ionocytes relative to the other secretory cells. The roles of the ionocytes uh, in an anion transport and Acid-base regulation, we think, are going, to are going to require studies under physiologic conditions with bicarbonate present and with PCO2 being physiologically relevant. And, and we'll also need to uh, incorporate non-gastric HK ATPAs and vacuolar proton pumps uh, into the model, along with Pendrin, especially during inflammation, when that's going to contribute. And I'll just end my talk here. Um, by uh, acknowledging the people that did all the work. Yukiko Sato was a former graduate student in my lab who's now in a biotech company. Uh, she did all the initial work on the uh, characterization of the, of the virus. Uh, Dusik Kim is uh, measuring pH and studying uh, intracellular. I didn't talk about that. And also extracellular pH changes in the ionocytes uh, in rich cultures. Uh, Mark Turner got us into phosphodiesterases and w took uh, care of that part of the story. And Nathan Scales is a programmer and mathematician in, 
who uh, is a former graduate student of mine, uh, now working uh, in, in Ottawa, but uh, collaborating. And Yishan Luo made the uh, Dino viral constructs that we use, and Dave Thomas is a longstanding collaborator that we discuss all these problems with. And I have to acknowledge the funding of, of CF Canada and also uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which uh, gave us a pilot and feasibility study to get started on this. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. I thought that that really, truly provide the CF field with a new tool to investigate the cell biology and physiology of ionocytes. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bridget Klumperts, who is a professor of pediatrics and pulmonary medicine at UCLA and the associate director of translational research at UCLA, uh, UCLA Broad Stem Cell Research Center. And she'll be presenting an important topic on targeting CF airway for gene therapy. Thank you so much to um, Ruby and to AP for this opportunity um, to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing in the lab. And um, this um, original picture, this original work of art that I'm showing was actually done by Matt at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And um, it, I think it's really a very nice introduction into what I want to talk about today, uh, which really builds upon the beautiful work um, from the people that you've heard already in the session, which is thinking about which cell type should we really be targeting in the airway for gene therapy. Okay, so I should go back and say I have no disclosures. So what I want to talk about today um, is really, um, as I said, thinking about which cells should we be targeting for gene therapy. I'm going to focus in on the cartilaginous airways and talk about cell types and cell subtypes, um, and then how those um, cell subtypes are a little bit different in cystic fibrosis. From there, I wanted to go on and talk a little bit about the challenges that are being experienced um, with gene therapy delivery, some of the things that are happening in the clinic right now and are, and are coming through. And um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, airway delivery as well as systemic delivery. And then thinking from there a little bit about systemic delivery, and we don't really, or it hasn't been a lot of work done in the space about thinking about systemic delivery mm -hmm. and where those cells might go. And so I want to touch a little bit on that. So um, I think everybody in the room is familiar um, with um, the cartoons that I'm showing. And um, essentially, again, I'm focusing in here on the cartilaginous airways, which are directly in contact with the environment and therefore um, fulfill this really critical role um, in mucociliary function. And um, about five years ago, when I, when I started out in, in, um, in this field in, in cystic fibrosis, I was very fortunate um, to get involved um, with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation through a consortium on lung stem cell biology and this was really the state of the field in that um, we understood that there are basal cells, uh, which are stem cells. Um, they considered to be true stem cells of the airway because of their ability to self renew as well as to differentiate into the mucociliary cell types of the airway. And we knew that there were secretory cells um, as well as ciliated cells, which have these microtubular structures, which beat unilaterally um, to move um, mucus, um, which has trapped all of the uh, viruses and bacteria and, and bad particles that we breathe in up and out of the airway. And we reasoned that um, if we're gonna think about a gene therapy um, for cystic fibrosis, that we really needed to have better clarity on these different cell types, thinking about about whether there might be cell subtypes and whether some cells might be better to target than others. And of course, you know, you could think about this in terms of the different delivery strategies as well. So for example, if you're thinking about an mRNA strategy, then potentially targeting an apical cell, for example, a secretory cell uh, might be just fine. But if you're thinking about gene integrating strategies and uh, long-lived um, stem cells, which you would want to target, of course, to have that long-lived effect, um, then you really needed to know more about the stem cells of the airway and what those might look like. 
And that was really the impetus um, for us um, to, um, to, to get involved in um, what ended up being a, a really great um, collaboration uh, with, with all the investigators within that consortium. Um, but particularly, um, there were three groups involved, um, our group at UCLA, Barry Strip's group at Cedar sinai Medical Center, and Jed Mahoney's group from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And in a real tour de force, we were able um, to collect uh, 19 CF patient samples as well as 19 what we called control patient samples, which was really um, airway from patients who had not previously had um, any lung disease. But of course, these are not completely normal patients because um, they had all had some you know, degree of trauma um, and um, resulting in, in brain death um, and were all on ventilators. Um, and of course, the cystic fibrosis samples that we obtained were from end stage patients. So I think these are really um, important to think about as we look at the single cell RNA sequencing data from these patients. But um, what I think you can appreciate from this cartoon, um, which is color coded based on the different institutions, um, is, is the sites that we collected were really um, predominantly very close to each other um, and really um, represented mostly um, bronchi and a little bit of um, the carina as well. And um, uh, basically, what we did is to, um, you know, collect, um, you know, a very large amount of data across these three institutions. And of course, there were major challenges in terms of thinking about batches. Um, the tissue was um, handled differently at the inst different institutions. And um, two of the institutions did 10x sequencing. Uh, one institution did drop seek sequencing. And so there was a whole lot of um, data that came in across all of all of the groups. And um, the bio Informatics people were incredible across um, all of the institutions um, to really try and figure out how to take the data that was in common. So looking at gene expression profiles across cells that were in common um, and just calling the data on that um, group and um, excluding all the other data. And so that's why we felt um, confident in calling um, the subpopulations that we ended up calling. And this is a list of um, what we found um, on the right. And I think um, this has really helped us um, expand our, our knowledge and our thinking of the surface airway epithelium um, of these cartilaginous airways. And um, really, um, when we think about basal cells now, we don't just think about one type of basal cell. We think about five different kinds of basal cells. So um, the basal one is really the canonical cells, which is what we think had classically thought of as basal cells. Um, basal two would be the cycling basal cells. Basal three represents the basal cells that are actually transitioning um, to a secretory um, cell. And so I think that um, the sequencing is also capturing a lot of the dynamics of the airway and the fact that a lot of these cells are transitioning and they're not really static. And then um, basal four would again be another transitioning cell, which would be the basal cell to ciliated cells. And this basal five population, I, I think is particularly intriguing. It's really the smallest subpopulation of all the basal cells that we found. And it was really only um, sort of distinct in the fact that it's very high in beta catenin. And of course, um, when beta catenin signaling we know is really important in the airway, and we've sort of been wondering whether this might represent a reserve cell population um, within the airway. And then we come to think about secretory cells. And again, this is important if we're thinking about targeting of cells. Um, the secretory um, one sub subtype is more club-like. Secretory two is more like a goblet cell. Um, secretory three um, are, the, again, um, transitioning cells. These are secretory to ciliated. And um, secretory four being more mucous and secretory five being more serous. And even within the ciliated cell populations, we were able to get a sense of the maturation of the cilia with an early maturation compared to a later, more mature ciliated cell. And then a really interesting cell um, subtype that we really don't understand very much about, which is these ciliated cells that have an immune um, gene expression signature that, that, that's also present within the cell type. And then you've heard a lot about the rare cell subtypes today, and I won't talk a lot about them, but we found did find a few rare cells, the FOXN4 ionocytes and the neuroendocrine cells. So um, when we looked at this diversity of epithelial cell subtypes, we wondered whether there might be differences in expression between cystic fibrosis patients and our control patients. And, and I think we thought that there would actually be very large differences. And I think one of the big surprises from our data was actually there were not that big a difference. The cell types are the same and the cell subtypes are really the same. There are just some very subtle differences that I'll, that I'll highlight in a little bit. Um, but if you look um, 
FSU map, which has just clustered those single cells based on their gene expression patterns, you can see the green, um, different shades of green represent the different basal cells at the bottom in yellow, orange, and red are the um, secretory cells, and on the right are the, are the, are the blue represents the ciliated cells. And you can see that if you compare the control versus the cystic fibrosis patients, there's really not a lot of differences. Um, and um, What's also interesting in this UMAP is you can see these transitioning cell populations as they move from basal to ciliated or secretory to ciliated, for example. And then um, this is a heat map on the right, which really shows this, the, the same um, thing, but in a, in a different representation. And here on the left are different um, genes um, that are um, sort of some of the most highly expressed that go with each of these populations, uh, which are represented across the top here. And then we have gray and red uh, representing control versus CF. And you can see as you move down the heat map that there's really not a lot of differences between cystic fibrosis and controls. So what about CFTR? Of course, this was one of the big questions that came up when we started looking at our data. Where is CFTR expressed? Again, thinking about which cell might you want to target. And as you've heard before, and again, what we consistently saw in our data is that, again, it's the ionocytes that really have the highest expression by far um, of CFTR. But we also noted that there is a fair amount of expression within the secretory cells. And just by sheer numbers, um, if you move across and look at the data on the right, this is just the percentage of CFTR expression in total, um, you realize because these ionocytes are so rare, but the secretory cells are pretty frequent, that there's actually more CFTR being expressed across all of the secretory cells than within individual ionocytes. So if you're going to target just one cell type, and it's a rare cell type, and you're pretty confident about that, then the ionocytes is probably the way to go. But if you're going to have to more blanket um, target cells, then probably getting it into secretory cells um, may be enough. So this is a validation. Of course, when we, when we submitted the manuscript, people wanted us to validate um, the gene expression signatures, you know, which, of course, um, is, is completely fair. And so um, this is some immunofluorescent staining that we did to validate the secretory populations, all five of them. I'm just going to walk you through. On the top panel are the lower power views, and on the bottom panel um, is, um, is the more high power view. And um, when we looked at the secretory one um, cells, these are the SCGB. B1A1 high expressing cells, and you can see that they're very nicely expressed in the surface airway epithelium. When we looked at the secretory 2 cells, these express both SCGB1A1 as well as MUC5B and MUC5AC, and we do find these secretory 2 cells again in the airway pretty frequently, um, as well as um, these secretory 4 cells. Now, secretory 4 cells um, are high expressing in MUC5B, and they are present on the surface airway epithelium, but they're much more highly expressed within the submucosal glands, as, as, as already known. So again, validating the data. Um, and then when we look at secretory 3, um, these are the interesting cell types that are transitioning to being um, ciliated cells. Um, and again, we saw that there was FOXJ1 expression as, as well as MUC16. And then um, if we look at secretory 5, um, these are the cells that are highly expressing in lactoferrin. And again, we saw them um, mostly, in fact, almost exclusively uh, within the submucosal glands. So having validated um, at the protein level um, these five different subpopulations of secretory cells, uh, we then went on um, to look at these basal ciliated cell subtypes. And um, we were able to validate them both um, at the level of in situ hybridization as well as with immunofluorescent staining. Here we're looking at co-expression of keratin-5 by immunofluorescent staining and LRRC6, uh, which it, um, we've managed to find in some rare cell subtypes. And what was interesting is when we came to quantify and count the number of these cells um, that were transitioning from basal to ciliated cell subtype, we found that there was an increase in cystic fibrosis, which was rather unexpected. And we saw the same thing when we did co-immunofluorescent staining uh, for FOXJ1 and keratin-5. And this is quantified over here. And so, you know, we, we don't know for sure, but it seems like the ciliogenesis program is really turned on in the cystic fibrosis patients. And it's possible that this is because there is more injury and therefore more loss of ciliated cells. Um, but it's also possible that there might be a block in differentiation of ciliated cells with this pushing through of the ciliogenesis program. So we're not sure why that is, but we again found that um, really interesting. 
And then um, the next thing that we looked at was um, basal cells. And I told you that there were some subtle differences in the number of cell subtypes. Um, and the basal cell, and these are the cycling basal cells, is one important difference that we found between end-stage CF lung, and I'll qualify that as end-stage CF lung, as compared um, to the our control patients. Um, and we um, did UMAP analysis specifically looking just for the cycling basal cells and saw a reduction in the cystic fibrosis patients, which we validated by immunofluorescent staining, and this is co-staining for keratin-5 and um, for PCNA. And so um, we, we're not exactly sure how to explain this either, why there are less cycling basal cells in CF, given the fact that there's injury and repair. Um, but um, we're thinking that perhaps this is because these are end-stage lungs and this may be just an exhaustion effect. Um, but of course, it's really important if we're thinking about targeting basal cells, that if we're going to be targeting cycling basal cells, that may not be the cell type that you would want to hit if you're thinking about um, gene therapy. And then one other um, point that I wanted to bring up, and um, I just have sort of one snippet of data um, for this, and this is when you take the basal cells out of the um, airway and um, you try to um, subtype them based on the surface receptor expression, and this is work that was done um, by Gianni Carraro at um, Cedar sinai um, there are some surface markers that make it fairly easy to separate out different basal cell populations. And here Gianni um, used the CD66 and the, uh, the CD266 um, populations. And if you take it out of um, live, freshly isolated um, tissue, there's a pretty nice spread in terms of distribution of these cells that you can get basal 1 and basal 3 cells um, pretty easily. But if you continue to culture them, and this is after just one passage in culture, you see that actually you, you lose that complexity and the basal cells become much more like basal 1 canonical basal cells. And so this is something I think that's really important if we're going to be trying to model um, gene therapy is to realize that when we start culturing these cells, um, even in, and this was um, done in ALI, um, we have to realize that um, there are going to be changes that are going to happen in culture um, with sort of clonal evolution of certain cell subtypes that may not be representative of the actual in vivo tissue. So in the last part of the talk, I just want to move um, to this uh, whole idea of the challenges of gene therapy and this idea of maybe airway delivery has got a lot of challenges and maybe systemic delivery um, could be another way to go. And um, this is just some um, H&E um, um, pictures, that micrographs that I, that I um, actually just pulled off the internet. And I, but I think they nicely highlight the problem. So on the left is the surface airway epithelium. There's mucus on the top. Obviously, there are a number of different um, cell layers. Uh, we have the pseudostratified columnar epithelium with all of the cell types um, sitting on the basement membrane with the nuclei at different levels. And we have the basal cells at the bottom. And here I'm thinking about um, a, a, a situation of um, gene therapy where we would want to really integrate into to a long-lived stem cell compartment. And I think that this has been really challenging for the field. And um, there's a lot of work that's being done in this area. But even just getting through CF mucus, we know is incredibly difficult, let alone down to the basal cells. And so that uh, led me to think about, so what about systemic delivery? And where are the blood vessels? And, and could that be a viable option? And so here I just want to show you that the capillaries, there are capillaries coming from the bronchial circulation um, that are located just below the basement membrane. And I think it's really possible that there could be some diffusion and some basolateral targeting of the basal cells with this approach. But I also wanted to point out that with the submucosal glands, um, the um, the capillaries are really closely um, aligned within the submucosal glands. They are really right around and wrapped right around those submucosal glands. And so this is really another possibility is that we could be targeting submucosal glands. And what we also realized is that we really don't know very much about submucosal glands and the submucosal gland cell subtypes. And um, this is just a cartoon uh, which says that um, we know that basal cells are a stem cell of the airway, um, but there's also beautiful work that's been done by people in the audience here too, in terms of looking at gland duct cells and myoepithelial cells, uh, which are also thought to be stem and progenitor cells in terms of their capacity for self-renewal and for differentiating into um, all the cell types of the submucosal glands as well as the surface airway epithelium. And I think it's also really important to remember that these stem cells um, don't exist on their own that there's very much a niche and that there are a lot of cell types that are around the submucosal glands and below the basement membrane. And these include things like nerves and capillaries, obviously, with endothelial cells and inflammatory cells and fibroblasts and, and all of those other kinds of cells. And so um, to address some of this, um, 
we have done some single cell RNA sequencing of um, healthy proximal airway. And what we really did is not to be biased just to the submucosal gland tubules. We really wanted to get that whole intercartilaginous zone to really get a, a good sense of what the niche cells are as well as those epithelial cells. And so this is um, some of the original, some of the um, early single cell RNA sequencing that's coming out of that um, work. And um, there are some um, really interesting cell populations, a, a lot of it expected, but some of it not expected. And uh, I say in terms of the immune compartment, I don't think there are any surprises. I think, you know, we all um, would imagine that there would be macrophages and neutrophils and of course B and T lymphocytes being represented and, and all those populations are there and there's probably some dendritic cells there too, um, which, you know, I think we would expect as well. In terms of the mesenchymal compartment, I think this is really interesting. There is a smooth muscle compartment that we know is present uh, within this intercartilaginous zone. Um, but there are different um, cell clusters based on how those smooth muscles look. So there are some uh, muscles that have got a really strong metabolic signature and there are some muscle cells that are dividing as well. And then um, in terms of the fibroblasts, there are these three different um, subclusters um, of fibroblasts that um, look really interesting. Only one of these subclusters is actually producing collagens, which I thought was really interesting. One is really a migratory type phenotype, and, and one looks like it has more of an inflammatory gene signature, which I think is also interesting. And then of course, we're able to see myoepithelial cells as well. Within the endothelial compartment, we catch sort of classic endothelial cells, dividing endothelial cells. We can find lymphatics in this area, which of course is known, but it's really you know, gratifying to see them at the single cell level, as well as more arterial and venous um, cells. And then I wanted to just sort of dive down a little bit deeper into the epithelial cells that are coming out of the submucosal glands and ducts. And on the left, um, from this beautiful um, review on submucosal glands, I just wanted to remind people um, that um, the glands um, contain the ciliated duct, which opens up through this virtual space onto the surface airway epithelium. There is this collecting duct here, uh, which is not present in, in all mammalian species, but which is really important in regulating mucus. And then there, there are the mucus tubules with the serous tubules on the end, and this is classically where CFTR has mostly been seen um, by, by immunostaining. And so, um, you know, I think some of the populations are expected. For example, we see ciliated cells. And again, just like in the, we saw in the surface airway epithelium, there's sort of the more mature versus less mature cilia, and then a, a, a subpopulation that we're calling motile cilia, just based on um, the, the pattern of gene expression. There is a, the secretory cells over here, and the serous secreting seem to be a little bit more distinct from the club cells. Um, and then there are two different mucus secreting populations um, that look very interesting. Um, in terms of the luminal population, which probably represents the ducts, there's a very clear population of keratinized luminal, is what we're calling it, because there's expression of certain keratins that look, you know, um, seem to be highly expressed. Um, but there are also these duct cells, some of which seem to be transitioning into these serous um, and potentially mucus secreting populations. There's more of a basal signature. We sort of called it a wound healing, but we don't really fully understand what this population is down here. It has a number of dividing cells too. And then what what I think is most interesting is a stem and progenitor cell population that seems to be going off and um, differentiating into serous secreting cells and maybe club cells as well. And th this could be a potentially um, really interesting population to target for gene therapy. So obviously there's a lot more work to be done um, to better understand what's going on within the submucosal glands and um, to see whether potentially um, systemic delivery may be a, a viable option as well for gene therapy for CF. So in summary, you know, we've created the cell atlas of the surface airway epithelium, and now we're trying to create the same thing for the submucosal glands, really to better inform um, the community about what the different cell types are. Hopefully, we'll be able to find really good markers and targets um, in terms of thinking about gene delivery. We talked about CFTR and how it's most highly expressed on ionocytes, but it's also there on secretory cells, which are very numerous. Um, we um, have also shown that some of the airway epithelial cell subtypes are altered in CF, although they are surprisingly similar. similar. And then again, submucosal glands um, have got lots of cell types that, that I think are of great interest, um, but still need to still be figured out. And then I just want to thank the people who did the work, um, particularly in, in my lab, Andrew Lund, who's, who's really taken on the submucosal gland project and um, has been um, trying to figure out all of these different cell subtypes. Um, all of this was done in collaboration with Catherine Plass Lab, and in particular, Justin Langerman, who's been the bioinformatics brains behind trying to figure out all of these cell subtypes and using novel um, algorithms and, and methods for trying to really um, pull out what these different cell subpopulations are. And then um, Barry Strips Lab and Jade Mahoney at the CF Foundation, we could not have done um, you know, what we did without all of their help. And of course, Scott Randell, Amy Ryan, and S. 
Leicester uh, were really helpful with that too. And of course, we're always really grateful for our funding support, particularly from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who really spearheaded all of this work. So um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Bridget. Um, so, the last speaker is going to be Dr. Ruby Wang. She's uh, assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. The most gracious physician scientist I have ever met. She's, she's really wonderful, you know. She's a pediatric pulmonologist and uh, attending um, uh, a, attending pulmonary at uh, Boston Children's. And uh, she started a lab a year ago. Uh, today she's going to talk about de novo generation of pulmonary inocytes from induced pluripotent stuff. So, Thank you so much, AP, for that very generous introduction. Um, I, uh, I, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I'm especially excited to follow the speakers today, as many of them were really inspirational leaders that inspired me to become a physician scientist and, um, uh, and to pursue the work that I, I will show you today. So today, I will show you mostly unpublished data of um, the generation of pulmonary inocytes, well, actually common and rare airway cell types, but focusing on pulmonary anocytes from induced pluripotent stem cells. I have no financial disclosures. And as we heard today, in the age of highly effective CFTR modulators, curing CF really requires an understanding of the cell types that express CFTR. So almost 30 years ago, Dr. Engelhardt identified these rare cells in the submucosal, uh, submucosal gland with high CFTR expression. And then it was thought that the main CFTR expressing cells were the multiciliated cells, but there were occasional CFTR rich luminal cells of uncertain significance. And as we heard in 2018, two groups, including Dr. Rajagopal's group, applied single cell RNA-seq to mouse and human airways and named these rare CFTR rich uh, uh, cells as the pulmonary anocytes marked that by the expression of transcription factor FOXI1. And since these landmark studies, more recent studies provided even more comprehensive description of CFTR expressing cell types in human large and small airways, and also in CF and non-CF patients uh, by Dr. Gompert that we just heard. And those secretory cells were the most frequent CFTR expressing cells. It was noted that ionocytes still had this highest expression of CFTR. So this might be outdated, but the functional roles and developmental milestones of pulmonary anocytes are still uh, intriguing and unclear. And um, there's still a need for additional human model system to study the fundamental biology and airway cells, including these pulmonary anocytes. And I hope to convince you in this talk that an induced pluripotent stem cell can be a complementary system to model CF. So in the uh, mid-2000s, Shin Yamanaka showed that by introducing just four factors, a somatic undifferentiated cell is able to be reprogrammed back to the embryonic stem cell-like state. And these induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, are able to be differentiated to various um, cells, including uh, lung cells, for disease modeling. And here, I'm showing you the iPSCs from a patient I took care of, someone who harbored the Delta 5OA homozygous mutation. And the other arm, of course, is that we're able to couple it with gene editing technologies of CRISPR-Cas9 with the hope of using it for cell therapy, which is a particularly exciting direction. And the benefit of this system is that it is patient-specific, it's non-invasive, as you just need 10 cc's of blood for reprogramming, and you have a renewable supply, it's amenable to gene editing, and it gives one access to otherwise inaccessible developmental milestones. So with this background, I'd like to introduce my overall study schema. I have recruited CF patients of various mutations and disease severities, which I will share a bit with you at the end of the talk. We have corrected the CFTR in multiple patients and differentiated the iPSCs to airway epithelium, both as bankable 3D organoids, as well as 2D air liquid interface cultures plated on trans wells. And the questions I'm gonna try to answer today are, uh, what cells are generated? How similar they are to primary? What cells express CFTR, and can this iPSC platform be used to model defect in ion and fluid transport? 
So in terms of directed uh, differentiation of iPSCs to airway, I was very fortunate to learn this from the Center of Regenerative Medicine at Boston University. And for sake of time, this will be simplified to just say that it's a stepwise directed differentiation process that aims to recapitulate in vivo lung development. So the first 15 days are our 2D, where we take an iPSCs through definitive endoderm, anterior foregut, and lung progenitors. And the lung progenitors are then purified and cultured as 3D airway organoids. But to be able to be cultured at air lucid interface, the protocol was optimized recently by Finn Hawkins, Shin Suzuki, uh, Suzuki, Brian Davis, and Daryl Cotton to generate airway basal cells, which are progenitors of the airway. And by culturing these cells in media supplemented with dual SMAD inhibitors. And the basal cells, which are identified by the surface marker NGFR, are played onto 2D transvals for mucosary differentiation and with generation of major airway cell types. However, even though we had trilineage differentiation, no ionocytes were seen with this original protocol. Since then, we have done some modification to the protocol. So um, given previous studies identified what I thought was basal cells as the main progenitors for pulmonary anocytes, but Jay has um, uh, shown some new data, which was uh, quite fascinating, we did hypothesize at that time that a subset of NGFR positive cells are able to give rise to ionocytes. Because we found that NGFR score is usually very low when the airway uh, cells are first exposed to the dual SMAN inhibitor uh, basal cell media. But with subsequent passaging and sequentially sorting NGFR positive cells for expansion, the NGFR score increases. And when we play these NGFR positive cells directly onto transvals and allow to expand in basal cell media, um, and then we differentiate it in pneumocal ALI media. And I'm going to show you the airways generated from one of my CF patients for whom we corrected the CFTR and differentiated this IPSC to airway cultured at air lucid interface using this protocol. Let me just make sure. So as you can see here, this is a bird's eye view of the airway transfer cultures um, after being in an air lucid interface for three weeks. And we see visible beating cilia, and it looks almost like a hurricane. And staining really shows generation of very beautiful, this carpet of alpha tubulin positive ciliated cells, MUC 5B positive secretory cells, as well as layer of keratin 5 positive basal cells on the basal lateral surface. So to further characterize the molecular phenotype of iPSC-derived airways cultured at air lucid interface, we performed single cell RNA-seq on multiple iPSC-derived airway from multiple donors. And here are the UMAP and heat map, and I've highlighted some of the uh, top differentially expressed genes from each cluster for readability. So we annotated the cell types as follows. We have a basal transitional cluster based on differentially expressed genes S100A6 and serpene B3. We have a secretory cell cluster based on differentially expressed genes SCGB1A1, SCGB3A1. We have an immature ciliated cluster based on differentially expressed genes CCNO and CDC20B. And we have a basal cell cluster based on um, uh, genes keratin 5 and keratin 13, a more mature ciliated cluster based on um, tubuli A1A and CAPS. And perhaps most excitingly for me, we saw the appearance of a separate cluster, um, which uh, uh, are, um, we would call the pulmonary anocyte cluster based on differentially expressed genes of FOXI1, ASCL3, and our favorite gene, the CFTR. And here are the UMAP where the primary airway gene signatures were applied and um, uh, showing again the basal, secretory, ciliated, and the ionocyte clusters. So delving deeper into this cluster five of ionocytes, the top differentially expressed genes again include FOXI1, ASCL3, but also has these other ionocyte markers seen in the primary cell types, such as uh, uh, IGF-BP5, TMEMN61, S, uh, SEC11C, TMPR-SS11E, and also had um, expression of the subunits of vacular ATPase, such as ATP6VOB. And J, we got 182 cells. <laughs> um, so this cluster consists of 182 cells out of almost 20,000 cells. And so the average frequency of ionocytes generated is about 1% of all cells in um, the differentiation. And this is exactly consistent with published frequencies of primary ionocytes in mouse and human um, airways. 
And as expected, as you can see, we did find more frequent representation of secretary, ciliated, and basal cell lineages in our profiles. So here I present again the INSR markers with, um, with a UMAP. Here's the clusters expressing FOXI1, um, ASL3, and also the more mature INSI marker of BSND. We also see that the cells in this cluster express markers implicated in ion transport, such as CFTR, which we all know is a chloride and bicarb transporter, but also express sodium channel, and here showing the beta subunit of ENAC, um, uh, as well as the uh, a calcium activated potassium channel KCN MA1 and the uh, uh, potassium, sodium potassium chloride co transporter um, SLC12A2, and again, the subunits of the vacular ATPase. And here's again the violin plots showing the increase in some of the ion side markers such as FOXI1 and ASCL3, um, as well as some of the ion uh, uh, markers that's implicated in ion transport. So we then asked the question of where CFTR is expressed in our IPS-derived um, single cell data set. So we found that for both CF and CFTR corrected IPS airway, about 10% of the cells have detectable CFTR transcript. And we found that the CFTR expression is highest on the iPSC-derived ionocytes compared to other cell types. And that's, again, consistent with observation in primary cells. And expression is also higher on secretory cells compared to basal and ciliated cells. And here's a UMAP showing the um, co-expression of CFTR and FOXI1 in this cluster. That being said, despite the high CFTR expression level, CFTR was more frequent in other airway cell types. Um, of the 10% of the cells that express CFTR, 60% of these CFTR positive cells were secretory cells, and only 7% of these CFTR positive cells were um, ionocytes. I just realized where the. Um, so taken together, this data really validates previous findings in primary airways that ionocytes express high levels of CFTR but make up only a small portion of CFTR positive cells. So to validate FOXI1 expression on a protein level, we perform immunostaining and we have identified these rare cells expressing nuclear FOXI1 protein in our culture. And here I show you a cluster of FOXI1 positive cells. Um, and uh, on the right is uh, 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 solitary FOXI1 positive cells in isolation in relation to MUC5B positive secretory cells. So a future direction is really to characterize neighboring cells and study cell-cell interaction with ciliated secretory or basal cells and compare the distribution morphology between CF and CFTR-corrected um, airways. We then asked how similar our iPSC drive airways are to primary airways. And to do this, we combined our iPSC data sets with single cell data sets from previously published um, uh, human bronchial epithelial cells cultured on air liquid interface, as well as that from uncultured fresh isolated lung tissue. And this is the combined data set that has not been batch corrected. And on the bottom, we see the UMAPs showing again the basal, secretory, ciliated, and ionocyte clusters. And as you can see, even without batch correction, the iPSC ionocytes clustered very closely with primary ionocytes. So here, I'm going to show you average Spearman correlation of each iPSC-derived cell cluster compared to both primary cell types. As you can see, our engineered iPSC-derived cell types correlate most closely to their primary counterparts um, compared to other cell types. For example, the iPSC ionocytes correlated strongly with the primary ionocytes um, from HBEX cultures as well as from uncultured, fresh isolated lungs. Uh, we also looked at the top differentially expressed genes of the iPSC derived ionocytes and compared it to the top differentially expressed genes from the primary data sets. And I hope you can appreciate just the significant degree of overlap. In fact, 
we found that among the top 100 differentially expressed genes of our iPSC-derived inocytes, 93% appear in the top 100 differentially expressed genes of a primary data set. We also quantify the expression levels and frequencies of INSI marker transcript in our cells uh, seen in blue here and compared it to the primary HBACs here seen in green and uncultured freshly isolated lung um, uh, in this salmon color. So for the INSI markers, we chose FOXI1 and ASCL3 as well as some of the top INSI markers in primary data sets. And we found very similar frequencies and expression levels of most of these INSI markers in our IPSC inocytes versus um, both of these primary inocytes. So taken together, hopefully I have convinced you that we have generated inocytes that are transcriptomically very similar to what is found in nature. So as you can see, we're working with very little cells. Um, and in order to really study development of biology, we need to increase these numbers. And to do so, we also transduced our um, iPSC basal cells in trans wells with a FOXI1 GFP tag lentivirus versus GFP only control lentivirus. And here you see the transduced cells labeled by GFP. And a higher mag uh, magnification shows that these cells are labeled with FOXI1 antibody. And the transverse section of a uh, cryo embedded iPSC airway again shows that the FOXI1 labels these GFP positive cells on the pseudostratified epithelium. And we saw that when we overexpressed FOXI1 in our iPSC airway cultures, it led to an increase in other INSI markers, such as ASCL3, and perhaps most importantly, a 60 fold increase in CFTR transcript. And then when we sorted on these green cells, these GFP positive cells, we again showed an enrichment in ASCL3 and CFTR in the GFP positive cells compared to pre-sorted cells, GFP negative cells, as well as cells transduced with a controlled GFP virus. So to enable for future sorting for inocytes, we mined our single cell data set, culture air liquid interface for potential surface markers, and the candidate list included NGFR as well as CKIT, uh, which we saw, um, the NGFR we saw was highly expressed in inocyte compared to other cell types after being cultured on air liquid interface. So we therefore asked whether sorting on NGFR positive cells from the iPSC airways will enrich for inocytes. Uh, we again overexpressed our iPSC airway at ALI with FOXI1 lentivirus, and we sorted on these NGFR positive cells. And we found that the NGFR positive cells had increased FOXI1 expression compared to NGFR negative cells and those given a control lentivirus. However, as you can see, NGFR is also on basal cells, so future studies include finding additional markers such as uh, CKIT to enrich for inocytes in conjunction with uh, NGFR. We were also intrigued by the question of what developmental pathway leads to the emergence of these inocytes. And given the known importance of notch in regulating airway cell differentiation and previous studies showing the importance of notch in inocyte maintenance, we used an iPSC line with a DOCS inducible notch intracellular domain. And we differentiated this iPSC to airways based on the protocol I just showed you and sequentially activate, uh, activated DOCS at both the 3D basal cell organoid stage and also when the cells were cultured on uh, air liquid interface. However, we found that activation of notch at either stage did not detect an increase, um, did not lead to an increase in FOXI1 expression, but we did detect an increase in CFTR at the basal cell stage. And we also validated prior primary findings in the mouse by both Jason Rock and uh, J. Roger Gopal that notch activation increased um, secretory cell markers and decreased ciliated cell markers. So future studies here really include manipulating pathways in addition to notch and assess for modulation of um, INSI frequency. So one of our current work in progress um, uh, is using the system to study the function. First, we ask, can we use the system to model CF? And to do so, my lab generated multiple CFTR corrected iPSCs. And we differentiated both syngenetic lines to airway epithelium and perform oozing chamber analysis. And as you can see here, the CF airway epithelium had little to no detectable CFTR dependent current shown here in blue 
whereas the CFTR dependent current in the corrected controls was in the range of primary HBAC cultures. So future work here really includes manipulating the frequency of ionocytes with the IPSC system and comparing the effect of the epi, uh, on the epithelial ion and fluid transport and mucociliary, uh, mucociliary transport. So lastly, I just want to highlight that because the IPSCs can be generated from anyone, it can provide a platform to look at individual cell types and to study individual biology. So in our CF center at Boston Children's, we have over 600 CF patients, and of those, I've recruited over 100 into my study of uh, various phenotypes. We have generated IPSCs and performed whole exome sequencing on 21 of the extreme phenotype CF patients, as well as those with typical CF um, phenotypes. And this is all prior to um, uh, being given modulators. And um, we have a rare group of patients whose lung function had no decline over 20 years, and many of them are in their sixth and seventh decades of life, and 80% of them had variants in ENAC. We also have um, a, severe, a more severe phenotype of CI patients, and many of them uh, died or needed a lung transplant before their first decade of life, and um, some have variants in uh, alternative chloride channels. And on paper, these patients all look the same with the same T uh, CFTR mutation and colonized with similar microbiota. So a plan is to differentiate these patients to airways, study the cellular composition, including pulmonary ionocytes, and also look at response to drugs, and look at the effect of candidate modifiers. And these IPSCs are uh, able to be shared with anyone who's interested. So with that, I hope to have convinced you that normal and CF IPSCs can be differentiated into common and rare airway cell types, including human pulmonary anocyte-like cells. IPSC ionocytes are trans uh, transcriptomically very similar to cultured and uncultured primary uh, ionocytes. Notch activation in that one line promoted basal cell differentiation to secretory cells, but was insufficient in that line to give rise to ionocytes. CF and CFTR corrected IPSC airway captured the defect in chloride transport. And hopefully, the IPSC platform provides a source of patient-specific cells with relevance for basic studies for future applications for regenerative medicine. And with that, there's so many people to thank. My newly formed laboratory, the uh, people who did a lot of the works include Chantel Simone Roach and Stuart Rollins, who is a CF fellow, an incredibly supportive uh, division chief, Benjamin Raby, and CF center um, directors, Gregory Sawick and Amit Euler, Torsten Schlager, who did a lot of the reprogramming for us, and the incredible mentorship and collaboration of Daryl Cotton and Finn Hawkins at the CREM and um, a, a big acknowledgement to the CF Foundation for providing much of the funding for the work that's being shown. I really want to thank you guys for your attention and happy to take any questions. I'd, I'd request all the speakers to come up to the podium. So if any one of you has a question, please feel free to come up. So I can start with some of the questions in the chat. And for our first speaker, uh, Jay, do you see any airway anatomic correlations of um, the POU2F3 positive progenitors, PNEC bodies, or just stochastic in distribution across the airway? Yeah, I mean, I think in the human, I mean, we simply haven't sampled enough to say anything. Uh, the neuro, the mouse and the human are going to be different. Um, we also have done work in neuroendocrine cells, and we simply can't find like clear neuroendocrine bodies as they occur in the mouse. Those are very specialized structures that occur in clusters of neuroendocrine cells at branch points and are innervated, and they're a canonical kind of place where you study neuroendocrine cells. Well, first of all, they may be very different than solitary neuroendocrine cells, and we don't see very clear neuroendocrine bodies at branch points in humans, but the human lung is huge. 
What we do know is that when you look in the mouse, there are discrete areas of overrepresentation of certain rare cell types in a reproducible fashion. So this means, for example, there's zonal tuft cell increases. And I think they're probably like sensory apparatus that we haven't figured out yet. When you take those cells and put them into a dish, they retain the cell proportionality that correlates to their in vivo anatomy. So there is, in the mouse, stereotyped local basal cell heterogeneity that's capturable in vitro. In the human, in my mind, like all bets are off. I mean, you know, the way I think about it now, it's, I'm not being defeatist, I just think there's a lot of work to be done. It's a big organ. And so it's going to be hard to, you know, map things out, especially when they're rare. Anything to add? Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, these are really good. Uh, that's a really good question. And the answer is, I, I don't know yet. Um, these are variants. And I think the beauty of the, INS, uh, of the IPSC system that year, we're able to do gene correction. And so we can ask in a syngenetic control fashion, what, what are the, um, maybe the effects of those um, variants. But I, uh, stay tuned. The subject of my KOA. All right. Um, Kevin Sorry, there's a lot of questions, if you, you don't mind asking. Yeah, I don't mind. So, um, uh, so it's just spectacular about the ionocytes, mm -hmm. uh, which I have never done you know, about decades ago in, in fishbill and in hawk skin. So in fishbill, it's clear that those ionocytes, called chloride cells, are secret, autonomous chloride secret growth cells. But the ionocytes, which are called mitochondria-rich cells in mm -hmm. hawk skin, provide the chloride pathway for sodium absorption, which is being mediated by other cells. So John, you showed that the CFTR chloride conductance was present in the apical membrane, but I wonder if it's also present in the basal lateral membrane of the ion mm -hmm. cell. Do you have any ideas about that? Um, which, which you're talking about? Which John? <laughs> with, with or without the beard? Um, I, I um, we didn't, we didn't address that. Uh, I, I suspect that it, it might change. I mean, we're not moving from urihaline to saline uh, uh, air or anything, so I don't know that it would switch, but it might be in physiologic, certain physiologic uh, situations, it might, it might switch around. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. No, we didn't look at the basal lateral membrane. You're asking, is, could CFP, CFTR be on the basal lateral membrane? Yeah, we, we don't see that. My guess is, based on the subset of ionocytes, there's some that are rich. For example, in ENAC, might have CLC and KA, um, you know, enriched. And then there are, are ionocytes that are more enriched than CFTR. And based on some of the fish work, you know, the CFTR can be regulated itself based on, you know, the environment, whether it's um, salt water or fresh water. Uh, whether or not that occurs in only in subsets or in all subsets, because we see CFTR at least at some level in, in all the three subsets that we have. But uh, John, um, we have a question for uh, uh, Dr. Engelhardt. So uh, it says, great presentation. Do you know if the defects you see in pH and ASL in FOXI1 knockout ferrets are cell-specific due to the lack of ionocytes or due to remodeling of the cytal architecture of the airway due to lack of that cell type? Yeah. Um, at, at the histological level, if we look at the types of cells that are in an ALI culture, we don't see a difference in FOXI1 knockout. 
Um, so the ASL pH change, which is a little bit different than what John Hanran had showed, it was measured differently. Um, you know, the buffer composition, I suppose, could also affect um, uh, what that outcome would be. I, I'd agree that ionocytes are also transporting protons. I mean, they have a ton of, um, of ATPases within them. So um, I don't know. I don't know if I answered the question again. <laughs> I think you asked, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I guess my question before John is an idiot. <laughs> I, I was intrigued by your comment about the uh, the uh, the the That was the hypothesis, yep. Yeah, I think, I think, um, so there's two points. First, uh, I think that one of the differences that in, in John's experiments from what we did was that he, you routinely put force colon with IBMX, right? Mm -hmm. and so he's already kind of excluding that aspect of the story by doing, by doing the combination. Um, in terms of why the cells would want to limit the force colon or cyclic AMP response, um, my only guess would be that it's to allow some other signaling mechanism to regulate CFTR in the ionocytes that that maybe it doesn't want to do for the secretory cells. So they would have a specialized function that have that you know you you would limit the force colon or the cyclic AMP regulated uh, stimulation of CFTR uh, in order to allow some other mechanism to control CFTR. That t total speculation, but that's that's what I would guess. <clears throat> Any questions in the audience? I have um, some questions for Dr. Gompert. Um, how do you isolate some mucosal gland cells specifically for single cell RNA seq? Um, and also in the CF airways, do you see any remodeling of the ionocytes population when compared to non-CF airways? Is it possible that ionocytes may trans differentiate towards secretory ciliated cells to compensate for an already defective airway? I guess <laughs> so oh. several parts yeah. there. <laughs> um, maybe I'll take the first part. So um, there are several ways to get the submucosal glands. Um, um, I think AP suggested earlier that you can micro dissect out the submucosal glands, but we um, did not take that approach. Uh, we basically mechanically remove the surface airway epithelium and then just take everything that's below the basement membrane, um, single cell dissociate that, and then sequence that. So that's the first part. And mm -hmm. um, the second part was around ionocyte, differences in ionocytes between CF and control, I think, was the second part. Is yeah. that right? In CF airways, do you see any remodeling of the ionocytes population when compared to non-CF airways? Is it possible that ionocytes may trans-differentiate towards secretory or ciliated cells to compensate for a defective airway? Yeah, so we didn't really, I mean, we got very few cells, so I would say we, we were only seeing rare cells, and we really didn't see much in the way of differences between CF and controls. Uh, of course, it's possible that those cells could be, you know, behaving in different ways in terms of de-differentiating or trans-differentiating, but it's not something that we were able to assess. <clears throat> I think this probably is, we can open up to the group, but fish scale ionocytes secrete chloride um, autonomously in front, oh, I'm so sorry, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, we haven't seen pancreatic disease, and we haven't seen the CF-like lung disease either. Um, you know, we've been able to raise them past rearing in order to do the imaging studies. We haven't challenged them. Um, you know, it raises some questions in my mind that, you know, if the disease starts in the distal airways, does that need to occur to precipitate something in the proximal airway? Um, but that's, that's the data. Um, I, I think I think at a functional level, when you look at an ALI culture, there are species-specific differences, and that's that's coming out of the single-cell seq data. So, uh, 
and you'll see it if you go to Fung's talk. Um, I have one that's for the panel. What information will groups need to target stem cell subtypes um, and how to make gene therapy technologies highly reprogrammable? Example, extracellular self, uh, cell surface molecules for targeting. Are there known differences between these different cell types? If the person is here, we could, uh, yeah. What information would groups need to target stem cell subtypes and how to make gene therapy technologies highly reprogrammable? It's, it's not exactly an answer to that question because there's an entire arena of gene therapy. So, But of course, there's different viral tropism. One thing I would say is the whole question of which cell to target is complicated because the cell you infect doesn't have to be the cell that you need to make. And early on, our group showed that you could take a functional differentiated goblet cell that was making tons of mucus and turn it into a basal cell. So the, the, the rule now, rather than the exception, is that epithelial tissues are plastic. So one thing, the obvious answer is to go into the basal cell. But I remember when I was in Iowa, Paul McRae suggested that sometimes when he did gene therapy of luminal cells, he'd see a basal cell. So that suggests that maybe you could actually de-differentiate as a... So, but I would be very wary in general to say which cell do you need to target because it might be easier than we think because you could target multiple different cells. And if you could durably make any of them into a basal stem cell, you're probably in good shape. I mean, we described that tip cell, right? But that tip cell almost, I'm sorry, we, I called it an ionocyte progenitor. But that cell almost certainly comes from a basal cell. Um, so ultimately, if you could reinforce a basal cell state, you'd probably be in good shape. I think this is for John um, Engelhardt. The hypothesis about ionocytes functioning as collaborative cells that influence others through their projections is very interesting. Do ionocytes express genes found in neurons, osteocytes, and other genes with long appendages? If so, have you considered knocking? knocking one or more of these genes out, specifically on ionocytes, to address this question. How right. else do you think this could be addressed as, in, uh, uh, as it has important implications? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, you know, the functional analysis of the, at least pathway analysis of the three subsets of ionocytes says one subset has this, you know, movement and appendage formation, and you can see that when you look in real-time imaging on ionocytes, that a subset are moving those arms around. What, what that's doing, I have no clue. Um, I, 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 I can't speak to whether or not they have like neuronal gene enrichment. I don't recall that, at least in the top, in the top pathways. I mean, what did surprise me is that, you know, there weren't a lot of gap junctions. And so, you know, when I think about what's the mechanism, is it cell autonomous or, you know, some sort of cooperative? I mean, it was the least of all the cell types, you know, to have gap junctions, and it was a very small subset. So I, I think there's going to have to be a single cell imaging method that images cells around the ionocyte, but not the ionocyte, in order to figure out the question. Can kind of add to that a little bit, which is neuroendocrine cells are called neuroendocrine cells, and I think they're basically proto nerves. And if you look at them, they actually have projections as well, and they have synapse uh, genes associated with them. Exactly who they touch, I don't know, but my, my imagination is you had a neuroendocrine epithelial cell, and then sometime in evolution it threw off an axon and then created a synapse. But the neuroendocrine cell has the basic machinery for synapse formation. So I don't know if that's going to apply to the tough cell and the ionocyte, but the neuroendocrine cell has exactly what someone is speculating about. Yeah, follow up on that question for Ruby, when you talk about cell-cell uh, -cell interactions uh, between an ionocyte mm. and a neighboring cell, what would your functional readout be? Oh, <laughs> Oof, that's a really good question. You might um, want to repeat it. I'm not sure that you can hear it. Would you like to question. repeat uh, um, to, I think to study the ionocyte-cell-cell -cell, um, interaction, what would the functional readout be? Um, 
I don't know, actually. I think maybe what you have shown in the quench, I, I, I don't, um, I am not sure, but we have talked about creating a system where we can look at the um, cell cell interactions, but. You'd have to have, you'd have to have some cell contact activated conditional yeah. genetics, which would be the way to do it. But Jay, what you brought up is a, a you know, great question. I mean, it could be that they're stimulating receptors on the basal lateral membrane of other cells that facilitate, you know, the same, the same thing. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's time. Thank you very much. Wonderful speakers and all of the audience. Thank you.